The information provided on this podcast is intended to be educational and informational only and is not considered to be formal legal advice. The listener should not take or refrain from taking action based on its content. Any listener in need of legal opinion upon which to rely in decision making should consider formally engaging an attorney to review relevant facts in detail and examine the pertinent law as it applies to those facts. Welcome to Real Estate Milestones, where we explore fascinating topics in commercial real estate with knowledgeable industry experts. I'm your host, Ben Malik, and I'm a young real estate professional who is passionate about adding value to people's lives through the incredible power of real estate. My goal is to help you discover what the heck is going on in the industry and how you can get involved. This is Real Estate Milestones, where your future in real estate lies just around the corner. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Real Estate Milestones. Today, I got my friend PJ Finley on the show. Uh, he's a climate optimist, an angel investor, and he has deep knowledge in commercial real estate, having been on the finance side of things for a few, a few years now. And he's passionate about making the world a cleaner and greener space through his knowledge of real estate and through other climate solutions. But um, And currently, he's the vice president at Northbridge which specializes in a special green financing program called CPACE, which we're definitely going to learn a lot about today. But PJ, uh, welcome on the show. Thanks for having me, Ben. Excited to be here. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on. So uh, let's start with, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career in real estate so far? And then uh, touch on your first milestone in real estate. Sure, absolutely. So my name is PJ Finley, as, as you mentioned. Um, I'm from outside Philadelphia, and my father is a home builder in the Philadelphia area. So I kind of grew up around real estate and construction. And throughout high school and college, I always wanted to work in construction. And so I worked for different contractors, whether it was HVAC contractors or other. And when I got to college, I went to Notre Dame and I studied accounting in the business school. Um, I had thought that my entry point to real estate would be through the construction management route. And so actually did an internship for Turner Construction, which is one of the largest general contractors here in the U.S., um, down in Philadelphia at the Navy Yard, and had an awesome summer, but ended up turning down a full-time offer to take up this opportunity I had for an investment bank here in Manhattan called Sandler O'Neill. And um, long story short, after my internship, I set out to, that internship was after graduation, I set out to find my landing point in the real estate industry. And I, I tried to look at things in three different segments. Um, the first is the equity side of the business. The second is the debt side of the business. And the third is capital markets. And I basically met with anyone and everyone I could over a span of call it three months and was fortunate enough to get an opportunity with the large loan team at CBRE in New York. And so um, joined a team that was new and growing and spent about four and a half years with that team, um, doing everything I could to contribute and, and grow it and had an awesome run. Um, and ultimately recently made the switch to Northbridge, which you referenced. But um, I guess my first milestone would be, um, would be making that concerted decision to go from traditional investment banking to find my um, you know, landing spot in real estate. Awesome. And I guess just a follow up with that, how did you decide to, or how did you decide which of those three aspects of commercial real estate you're uh, most interested in or wanted to find a job in? The only one I could get. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, uh, I had an opportunity with a, um, a group on the equity side that invested in office um, and also the large loan team at CBRE. And for a variety of reasons, um, personal and professional, I decided that being in New York, working on the advisory side, being an intermediary between both the equity side and the debt side, seeing a diverse um, array of deal flow, you know, all of those things I just, I, I highly valued. So it was the diversity of deal flow, the diversity of network, being in the, you know, center of Manhattan. Um, this is how I, you know, cho chose that. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, right in the center of Manhattan, right in a uh... MetLife building so, that's right. in the middle of Park Ave. So uh, that's kind of where I'm located as well. So um, I guess to touch on that a little bit more, could you tell us a little bit about your experience at CBRE and um, what you learned there and kind of what your, your role was? Yeah, absolutely. So I was on the large loan team sitting in New York covering all asset classes and all geographies. And 
what we consider to be the institutional space. So um, arranging loans on behalf of institutional owners, um, loans that are typically north of 100 million in size. And so it'd be everything from a 90% lease office tower in Manhattan to a ground up multifamily building in Phoenix to a vacant life sciences, office to life sciences conversion in Seattle. Um, and through that experience, I got to you know, certainly meet a ton of people, um, you know, the entire lending community across debt funds, banks, um, investment banks, life insurance companies, et cetera, to the equity community, whether it's the traditional, you know, large private equity firms in the fund model or developers that are running around tying up deals to family offices, et cetera. So from a network aspect, got to meet a ton of different people, but from a a deal diversity aspect that was just unbelievable. Um, and the people that I worked with there were just amazing and had, you know, diverse set of experiences themselves. And so being able to learn from them um, was just, it was an amazing atmosphere for me, you know, particularly in those, those early years. Awesome. And I guess you got to see some pretty, pretty notable large deals, which is probably pretty cool. See how yeah, these was. big villains are built. Fun. Awesome. So you recently moved over to Northbridge which um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what you guys do, but can you kind of talk about what informed your decision to make the transition to Northbridge? Yeah, sure. So I had the desire to move to the principal investing side from advisory and um, concurrent with that, I had a growing passion for climate solutions. And so um, yeah, I had kind of mulled over different things, everything from taking a you know, four to six months sabbatical to read, write, and travel and, you know, really hone in on what I felt was the, the highest and best use of my talents and time um, to, you know, even looking at, you know, climate specific industries like solar development and other things in that realm. Um, ultimately, I was connected with the founder of Northbridge and looked at the platform she was building and, you know, looked at my set of experiences, my network and, um, my ability to have impact kind of day one and it all made a lot of sense to me. So ended up taking the leap to faith, took about a five week mini sabbatical in between CBRE and Northbridge, um, got over to Europe for some time, which was fun and then started here in, uh, in April. Awesome. And before we jump into CPACE, I wanted to ask you about angel investing and kind of what, where you caught the bug for, um, that kind of alternative investment and uh, what you've been doing in that space? Sure. So I completely fell into it. Um, a buddy of mine named Jack O'Brien founded a company. He left Google to found a company with some of his buddies called One Pager. Um, and One Pager was a company that basically served as a landing destination for companies that wanted to communicate their message to investors, um, cons uh, potential customers and potential hires. So kind of a one-stop shop for um, communicating your message as a company, a one pager. And um, I had invested in that company because I believed in him and the team and I was excited by that and, and the product they were building. And through that, I started looking at other companies to invest in because the whole platform was looking at companies to invest in. and. I ended up making an investment in a vertical farming company in Ames, Iowa. Um, and through, you know, before making that investment, I, you know, took part in a long diligence process that got me to see things in a whole different way from an agriculture perspective and how agriculture is involved in climate change and um, what potential climate solutions could be coming out of the agriculture space. And I could talk about that for a long time, but um, that was really exciting. And then ultimately one pager got bought by a company called Stonks. Um, I reinvested in Stonks through that acquisition. And then, um, you know, I've been selectively looking at deals since then, but, um, you know, as we were talking about before the show, I view angel investing as a way to kind of promote my intellectual curiosities outside of real estate in a way that I can apply my skills that I've learned professionally and the same kind of diligence process to something unrelated to real estate that I think is really interesting. Um, and over time, you know, you have to expect to lose all your money in an angel deal um, because that's just the most, <laughs> the greatest probability. But um, over time, you know, if you, 
do one or two deals a year, you know, five, seven years, you, you hit one of them, it could be really meaningful. So um, it's exciting and it's fun to just learn a lot in these different spaces. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds very fun. Definitely an industry I want to learn a lot more about. So can you tell us a little bit about Northbridge and what you guys specialize in? Sure. So Northbridge is an alternative investment firm seeking to create sustainable real estate solutions. The first vehicle that we're investing through is called CPACE. CPACE stands for Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. And what that is, and it's, it's a bit nuanced, so I'll, I'll talk about it in as uh, efficient a way as possible, is we lend dollars to real estate owners that allow them to make their buildings more efficient, both from an energy efficiency standpoint and a water efficiency standpoint, sometimes seismic resiliency, but let's focus on the first two. Um, our dollars are collateralized at the assessment level similar to real estate taxes, you pay your taxes based on the assessment on your property. Our dollars are paid back via a real estate tax bill on an annual basis. And so um, all of that, all of that is to say that our dollars, because of that process, are much longer term and flexible and passive than traditional real estate loans. And so when you're looking as a borrower at achieving some sort of business plan or executing some sort of renovation where traditional financing options could be either cost prohibitive or structurally prohibitive, CPACE and our loans are a way to effectuate that business plan to encourage those clean energy uh, improvements. And so um, that's, the, that's the high level. Awesome. So how does it actually work in, in uh, application? So if a Borrower, let's say a borrower owns an office building in Manhattan and they have, um, you know, it's 50% lease and they've decided that to make their building relevant in the future to obtain tenants and also specific to New York to, to avoid um, fines from local law 97. Local law 97 is a regulation that um, basically monitors the energy consumption at buildings in Manhattan and New York. Um, and if you, if you don't meet certain thresholds, you get fined. And so for these building owners to keep their building relevant, they have to renovate, make it more sustainable, more energy efficient. Um, and most landlords are doing these things already. But when you talk about renovating an office building in Manhattan, office as an institutional investment class has fallen out of favor over the last two to three years. Um, and it's, it's not hard to imagine why. I mean, think about what happened with COVID. Um, all the headlines you see about working from home, that has materially affected the institutional investment world. So if I'm an owner of an office building that is 50% leased and um, I'm trying to get a loan to finance these upgrades, I'm going to have a really hard time because lenders are looking at that saying, the building's 50% leased, leasing is down in Manhattan. I'm, lo I'm lending on this building and I'm working from home. I don't know if I believe in that. Um, so how are you as a borrower going to come up with the dollars to renovate the building? And, you know, let's say you're a, a family office, for example, and the equity is all tied up in a trust. You don't just have, you know, families from a hundred different, uh, you know, parts of the city start coughing up cash to do the renovations. Um, you usually do it through a loan. And so if, if the traditional lending market is not there, CPACE is an effective way to address those in renovation. Awesome. So who does CPACE work for? Does it work for the mom and pop operator? Does it work for um, smaller multifamily or is it uh, more of an institutional product? It works for everybody. Our market target Northbridge is the institutional space. So institutional operators um, from an asset class perspective, it works for everything. I think you're going to see it most, mostly in the office and hospitality space, specific to New York. Multifamily is in such high demand, specifically in New York, but really everywhere, that the product most often will not be needed because the traditional outlets of financing are efficient. For an office building though, as I mentioned, where the debt markets are challenged and 
either you're going to have to pay an inexorbitant amount in interest rate, plus have you know extremely challenging structure, meaning tough extension tests, um, cash flow covenants, et cetera. CPACE could be an, an awesome alternative or replacement for say mezzanine capital or higher yielding senior, senior mortgage dollars. So um, I think you'll see it a lot in office, certainly hotels, mixed use, things with retail, um, probably not as much for multifamily, but you'll see it. Awesome. So how does the, I guess, how does the dollars actually get into the deal? I want to learn a little bit more about that because um, it sounds like, are you going to take a senior position? Or are you going to take more of a, a like a, a mezzanine position or, and is it like a preferred equity? Is it more, is it purely debt? How does it, how does it work? This is what's challenging to educate the market on, but our security is an assessment. It's called a special assessment on the property. And our dollars are paid back as a separate line item on the real estate tax bill. Um, because of that, on an ongoing basis, our payment is senior to the senior mortgage, just like real estate taxes are. However, in the case of us lending 20 million and a senior mortgage lending 50 million, in no scenario is the principal balance of our 20 million senior to the senior mortgage. It's only the ongoing tax expense assessment. And so lenders, when they look at the deal, they have to be okay with this certain strip of expense on an ongoing basis sitting in front of them, but it's not the full 20 million at any given time. So, um, the analysis for senior lenders is akin to how they look at ground lease deals. You may be familiar with ground lease deals in New York. Basically, all lenders, virtually all lenders have done a ground lease deal, certainly in New York. And those ground lease payments sit senior to the senior mortgage who's lending on that leasehold position. Um, and so senior lenders have to be okay with, okay, what is my position relative to this ongoing expense that's senior to me? The similar analysis for CPAs. So in, in the case of foreclosure, who gets paid back first? Good question. Um, our missed payment will get paid and then everything else goes to the senior lender. And your missed payment as in the payments that not including the, the balance of that you lended or correct. Basically. It's just the, it's just, so say, let's go back to the $20 million example. Um, you know, maybe your, your annual payment was, you know, $400,000 for CPACE and um, the, the borrower misses a payment. Only that $400,000 would get paid back to our bondholders. Everything else in a for sale would go to the senior lender. Then whoever buys the property would take on the burden of that ongoing expense, just like whoever buys the property takes on the burden of the ongoing real estate taxes. Yeah, and I guess the ground lease too for that matter. Ground leases are interesting because you have a lessor that could, you know, just say the lease is over, um, mm -hmm. the asset's mine, or they could then renegotiate with a new party or they could create a new lease. Um, it's a little bit different in that regard. Yeah, because I, I guess I didn't know if you could assume a ground lease or the 99 years would restart, so. Um, I think you can assume a ground lease. Someone, cool. someone could buy out that position. Sure. Awesome. That's interesting. So where, do, uh, where does Northbridge or who are the actual, um, I guess, investors or, you know, where does the capital come from that Northbridge lends out? Insurance companies. So insurance companies buy all our loans. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know insurance companies have a low cost capital um, compared to most other lenders. Exactly. So these are, these are at the end of the day, they're long-term fixed rate credit products and um, groups that have money that is that long-term are generally either insurance companies or pension funds. Um, and it's usually insurance companies. So um, those are our capital sources. Interesting. And so what incentivizes them to get into this market? Good question for them. My opinion, it's an exceptional risk adjusted return for what they're putting out. So our sp market spreads for CPACE loans are roughly, just think about it as 300 basis points over the 10 year treasury. 
in the institutional investment market, the 10 year treasury is what is thought of as the risk free rate. And so today, the 10 year treasury is at 2.75%. So if I'm to put my dollars anywhere in the investment landscape, I better be earning 2.75% or better. I mean, if it, certainly if it's a 10 year investment. If I'm not, I'm, I'm taking undue risk um, when I could just be investing in the US government. So as I look at where I want to put my dollars, I benchmark it, and that's why you have the term benchmark. I benchmark it over the 10 year treasury at 275. So for me to take real estate risk, you think of the term cap rate, for example, right? Like what's a cap rate for a multifamily building in Manhattan? I would argue they're in the fours sometimes. So let's say the cap rate is 475. 475 is a 200 basis point premium over the risk free rate. That's for taking the entirety of everything that comes with the risk of everything that comes with owning a multifamily building. We're talking about at 200 basis points. We're talking about 300 basis points for taking effectively real estate tax risk, you know, zero to 30% loan to value um, risk. And so for my money, I think that's an exceptional return for them. Um, so it makes sense for insurance companies because they're already investing at such a long horizon because assuming it's like life insurance, you know, the general life, life of someone is longer than 10 years, maybe longer than 30 years even. So when we're talking about um, having that kind of good risk just return and it, it seems like it'd be an illiquid investment, but that's why insurance companies would be the, the correct investor. Yep. Yeah. Insurance companies are interesting. They're, they're worth, um, looking into and how they're they're funded and how they make money, but basically, at a very high level, um, you as an insurance holder pay monthly premiums and or annual premiums, and that is all for the risk that if something happens, you get paid by the insurance company, and the insurance company decides what premium you pay based on some model that they have that says this individual is this likely to have X, Y, Z event happen. And if that happens, then they need to get paid X, Y, Z amount. Um, their profitability model is based on, okay, I'm taking in all of these dollars on an annual basis from all these different people. I need to then invest that and make a return that enables me to have both cash available in the near term in case something happens, but on a long-term basis, growing at a level that I can still make payments later on. And so um, because of that, insurance companies have this, this longer term horizon for investing. Um, there are also different investment uh, insurance products that I'm not as familiar with, but ones that, you know, life insurance, for example, I think there's some policies that, you know, if somebody passes away, then the, the, those left with the policy basically have a, um, a refurbished or a, you know a created stream of income, and to be able to have that created stream of income that's replicating the person whose policy it was, you need to have investment products that actually generate those returns. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, it's super interesting. I, I used to think insurance was a, a sketchy business because it's like the only way it's a good deal is if you prematurely die. But then I realized it's like okay, the risk of like the downside of me dying would be so much worse that I'd rather pay a premium to diversify across millions of people's lives. Because, yeah. you know, if I were to die, unfortunately, that would be so bad for my family. I guess not yet, but in the future, if I was a, yeah. you know, an income, well, there's, also, income earner. there's also disability insurance, right? Which, you know, if you get hurt and aren't able to work, then you then have a replicated stream of income. Um, so it's the same thing, just you're still alive. Um, but there are all these different products is obviously car insurance, home insurance, <laughs> it's it's a big and long industry totally so besides cpace which seems like a, a very powerful resource um how else do you see uh the commercial real estate being or how, what other innovations could be made in commercial real estate to you know i guess create this greener future of uh you know where we're treating the, cl the climate how how it needs sure. to be so it's quite interesting the real estate industry despite being arguably the greatest contributor to the climate crisis, has been infamously slow at adapting to new 
innovation and best practices regarding climate solutions. Um, passenger vehicle cars, for example, get all this attention. It's hard to read the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg without seeing news about electric vehicles in the news every day. Um, the reality is electric ve or vehicles as a whole, but passenger vehicles in particular, relative to real estate are just a fraction of the impact that real estate has on carbon emissions. Now, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong. You can check it out. Go to um, Bill Gates's website, breakthroughenergy.com. Um, I think passenger vehicles are only 8% of carbon emissions globally, annually, versus real estate, which through two vectors, the first is embodied emissions. Embodied emissions are emissions generated from the procuring, manufacturing, construction and uh, disassembling of buildings. And the second being operational um, emissions generated from the operations of a building, namely energy consumption. Um, through those two factors, real estate is responsible for 40% of um, emissions globally, annually. And so for all the talk about electric vehicles, it's unbelievable to me that real estate has gotten away, you know, somewhat unscathed by the media. Um, and so that was part of the reason for me making the switch was you have this massive problem, but you also have this massive opportunity where you have need for change, you have opportunity for growth. So um, the way I look at things specific to real estate and emissions is really threefold, fourfold. Um, embodied emissions, operational emissions, location-driven emissions, which I don't think are talk talked about nearly enough, and then the principle of reduce, reuse, and recycle. Embodied emissions um, can be reduced in a variety of ways, but the first and greatest thing the real estate industry can do is by leveraging the existing building stock. If you look at an existing building and it has all of this concrete built in it and, and cement, which is part of concrete, 15% of, of concrete, is responsible for 7% of global emissions annually. To knock that building down and build a new one, you're wasting all of the emissions that were generated by, um, by the construction of that. And so, and there's, you know, that goes for everything in it, steel, which is a, is a massive contributor, um, plastic and et cetera. Um, so leveraging the existing building stock and being thoughtful about the materials that are going in, whether it's low carbon cement, mass timber, which is a new technology that um, basically has allowed construction to use wood to build taller and stronger than ever before. Um, and just other technologies, better steel. Um, so that's embodied emissions. The second is operational emissions, achieving net zero through a reduction in demand. The way to, two things, reduction in demand. Second is electrifying everything. The way to reduce demand in a building is to make it more efficient. Um, in the same way that, you know, you put a coffee in a Yeti cup and 12 hours later, it's still hot. Um, that's because it has strong insulation. If you make your building better insulated, you don't have to use as much energy to heat and cool it. And so um, making buildings better insulated, more efficient, reduces the demand, meaning the amount of energy you need. And then second, electrifying it, electrifying everything from the HVAC systems to um, you know, the appliances, gas stoves, et cetera, changing to electric, which allows you to rely on the grid, which the grid currently, you know, in Manhattan, I believe it's, um, or New York broadly, the grid is, I think, 20 to 25% renewable energy. And you have to check me on that. Um, but by 2030, it's going to be 70% renewable by implementing all these different um, uh, programs throughout the state, whether it's offshore wind, solar, pa solar panels, projects, um, and then the Hydro Champlain Express uh, deal that's coming down from Quebec, which is using hydro energy. So you're shifting um, the power source to renewable. And as you electrify buildings, you're relying on a grid that is increasingly becoming renewable and over time will be all renewable. Um, so that's embodied emissions, operational emissions. The third, which I'm uh, becoming more and more passionate about is one that I think real estate as a whole has failed to address, which is if I have the most sustainably built building in the world, 
and I drop it in the middle of a field far away from all other buildings in civilization. By definition, that building is no longer sustainable because think of all of the energy that it's going to take to move people to and from that building every day, all of the goods and services, et cetera. Even if they're all moved to and from by Teslas, you know, now you have to create all these Teslas. Um, whereas if you put that same building in downtown Manhattan, which can leverage public infrastructure for transportation, walking, biking, all these different things, you've now greatly reduced the energy related to transportation. And so on a broader scale, that means as a, as a, as the public investing in public infrastructure and mass transit, but on the private sector, creating desirable places in high density areas um, that are supported by mass transit. And so um, I encourage the real estate industry to think thoughtfully about how we can build creative destinations that leverage mass transit. Um, and there are some cities that do a great job of that. There are some cities that do a horrible job of that. Um, that's number three. And then the fourth is reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, a few things that are really interesting that I think all building owners should, should legitimately consider are, um, or one, accessing the reclaimed materials market. Um, for decorative reasons, you can do things like reuse um, old brick or old lumber that was used in, you know, buildings, say, in, in Manhattan that has since been disassembled, um, that can add really cool aesthetic and architectural features that you don't have otherwise. Um, the second is the um, recycling. So not only just like encouraging recycling at your building, but wastewater treatment. How can you reduce the amount of water you're taking out of the public system and um, you know, recycle on site. There are different systems that I need to get smarter on that are promoting the fact that they can, you know, reduce water consumption by some crazy amount, I want to say in the 90% uh, level. So I just kind of ranted for a while, but it's four things, reducing embodied emissions, reducing operational emissions, um, strategically placing assets to reduce location driven emissions, and then reducing, reusing and recycling at every opportunity. Well, that's a very broad and deep Sorry. Under, no, thank you very much. I think that's uh, very helpful for me and for everyone listening that um, this is like actually like, I mean, it sounds like it touches on um, and everything we, we need to think about. But what, what like the question that comes to mind for me is how do we get to this point where all these initiatives are considered? Where I think, um, I guess we're in a pro, uh, it's a pro, it's a for profit industry and generally the alignment of interests in all of the corporate world tends to be optimize or, you know, maximize shareholder value, which ne not, would not necessarily always align with um, sure. green solutions. So I, I wonder what's your suggestion for how these things can get implemented? Um, so, I mean, yeah, what kind of changes as a society or as a government or, you know, an industry, what, how would you say this can be achieved? Well, there's two different, factors at play here. The first is revenue. The second is cost. And I'll address them in reverse order. So cost, everybody's focused on cost. You know, why am I going to spend all this money upgrading the envelope of my building or adding solar panels or using low carbon concrete um, if it's not going to get me the return? From everything that I read and people that I talk to, generally the costs are there. Now the upfront costs may be higher but your ongoing costs generally are reduced because when you make your building more energy efficient, it means you have to consume less energy. And so there's, I'll give you an example. There's a certification for building envelopes called the passive house certification, which came out of Germany a number of years ago. And there's quite a bit of literature out there that suggests that building to a passive house standard only costs building owners either the same or up to a 2% increase in costs. However, the ongoing costs are reduced from a demand standpoint by 90%. So quick math would suggest that even if you have a 2% increase in hard and soft costs, if you have 90% less reduction in demand for energy, you're going to make that back fairly quickly. 
Um, you know, everything, everybody likes to pick on solar. Some, you know, solar doesn't work if you don't have the tax credits in some scenarios. Um, so, you know, I, I understand that. Um, but generally, building in an environmentally conscious manner from the research that I have done largely is an economic imperative, meaning it is the right thing to do. So that's the cost side. The second side is revenue. And there's a variety of factors that I could talk about for a while here, but let's pick on uh, corporations, for example, office space. So no matter what you wanna say about office in Manhattan, it's not going anywhere. Um, there are going to be firms that work from home permanently and that is what it is, but by and large offices are still, corporations are still signing leases for office space in Manhattan. Um, where are they leasing office space? If you look at the rent diagrams from 2019 to today, class B and class C office has declined. Class A has kind of just hovered. New construction and trophy has literally gone off the map. Um, and part of that is because tenants are seeking sustainable energy efficient space. Um, I'll pick on public companies, for example, 92% of companies in the S&P 500, as of the year of 2020, produced an annual sustainability report. So that's putting out to the public, here's what um, our goals are, or here's what our emissions are, et cetera. The second you do that, it would be, uh, try to find the right word, it would be you know, against your your report or your thesis as a company to then go out and get non-energy efficient space. Um, and so that plus the SEC is proposing to require companies to publicize their scope one and scope two emissions with a potential for scope three to be included. Um, all of these things are suggesting that publicly traded companies are going to have a lot of scrutiny on them as to what space they occupy. And so whether you believe office is this or it's that, it's clear to me that the tenants that are signing leases of which there are still many are going to need space that is energy efficient. And so um, if there is not ample supply of that space, you will have pricing premiums that you see in other industries, personal vehicles, for example, um, I was just doing research on this the other day, personal vehicles are 22% on average more for electric vehicles than uh, combustion vehicles. Um, food, uh, the numbers that I saw said 50 something percent of consumers say they're willing to pay more for sustainable labeled food, despite the fact that there's a 15% pricing premium. Consumer goods, same thing. I think the number is about 20%. So um, I don't know that real estate investors are underwriting those pricing premiums. I, I don't think they should, but I think you're going to see that if tenant and investor demand for sustainable space outpaces the supply of it, which it very well might if, if real estate owners aren't you know paying attention. Yeah, that's really interesting because in, from my perspective, I always saw that if we could get costs of renewable and greener, you know, office or greener, just like anything in general, if you can get it to be more profitable, to be sustainable, that it, whether or not you're, you know, have a, the moral obligation to, you know, invest in green solutions or use green products, um, it would make sense to do it if it was, if it was economic um, incentive to it. Sure. So that's definitely a, uh, interesting to hear that you already think that we're at that point. Cause I think that's the, that's the pivotal point that um, needs to be met. Um, but also something, an idea that you gave me is, um, you know, what, if it's actually that much cheap, like cost or that much costly already to have sustainable um, energy and sustainable infrastructure, why shouldn't there be a company that goes in, buys a property, mm -hmm. makes it green and then sells it? Because if you could actually make a, if you could actually, boost the NOI by reducing costs or maybe even raising demand that would translate into more, uh, you know, forced appreciation. So could yeah. that be a business strategy? Absolutely. I think you're going to see a lot of that, um, you know, 
office space in Manhattan, for example, is something I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what, what is going to happen to all of this office space that is outdated, tired, and, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, degrading. Either building owners are going to invest and try to make it more relevant, as we discussed earlier, or convert it to multifamily if they think it's feasible, or they're going to have to sell and take the losses and allow someone else to take on that risk. And um, I, I think people are going to make a lot of money converting uh, or renovating, you know, class B office and having it play in that A minus, you know, league where you're able to meet the demand of these tenants that are seeking energy efficient space. Um, but it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, you know, putting a lot of money into office right now is for a lot of people, you know, scary uh, because they don't know if it's going to work out. So those people go invest in multifamily and industrial and there's a line of people waiting to do it next to them. So um, uh, I think that you'll see a lot of that over time, um, but it's, it's certainly risky. Um, risk and reward are correlated but they should be in an efficient market awesome well when you're ready to start that company give me a call happy to have you back in the podcast <laughs> awesome so, <laughs> i'm saying I, I i expect that people will do that yeah. uh, at northbridge we're focused on cheap pay funds right now <laughs> part All of right, which well, is helping people renovate office buildings awesome well that's uh definitely definitely makes sense after all we've learned so you ready for the lightning round let it rip Sweet. So what superpower would you choose if you could have any superpower? I forgot. I saw this in the uh, email. Pre. <laughs> I actually, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go a different route here. No superpower. I love the, uh, the small challenges of life. Awesome. Well, I love that. So what's your favorite book or what's the one that's helped you the most in uh, your journey so far? One recently that I read that had a profound impact on me is Elon Musk's biography by Ashley Vance. Um, he's certainly a polarizing figure for a variety of reasons, but I felt compelled to read about anybody who has had his level of success and, and impact on the world. And high level summary is I haven't come across anybody who sees less barriers to them achieving their goals than him. He simply says, this is what I want to do. Here's why I am now. I'm closing the gap. Um, and I really respect and admire that quality of him. Awesome. He definitely has an image for a sustainable future, which is um, pretty inspiring. So uh, what motivates you to continue every day? There are two things that drive me generally. Um, the first is I've been given a lot. Um, in a lot of ways, the scale has been tilted in my direction my entire life. I grew up in an amazing family. Um, I was able to attend amazing schools and you know, was fortunate enough to get a good job and all, and all these, you know, just amazing things. And for me, as, as great as that is, that's, that's also a huge responsibility. You know, I have to, I feel, have an impact on the world that is commensurate with the things I've been given. And so, um, you know, achieving and giving back to a level that, um, you know, is warranted by being given that much means a lot to me and not having someone be able to say, you know, oh, you were just given all these things. Um, I want to be able to say I was given all that and I did everything I possibly could to make it into something special. So fear of not doing enough with what I've been given, is number one. Number two is working on a team and fear of letting people down. Um, and that sounds weird to say it out loud, I guess, because they're both fears, but uh, it's true. And letting people down is something I lose sleep over. So um, I love working on teams. I was a college athlete. Um, that gets me really excited. So, you know, letting, letting people down is never an option. Yeah, it's, uh, it's powerful. Um, so what advice would you give to someone who wants to follow in your footsteps? Some of the best advice I was ever given is to make yourself indispensable to the person immediately above you to the point where if you weren't to show up, that person would say, Oh my God, where's, where's Tommy? Um, yeah, how am I going to get all this done? Um, I think that is 
that is critical, particularly in your early years. So I'll, I'll go with that. Awesome. Well, since I put you on the spot, I want to give you a chance for revenge. So what's one question you have for me? Um, sure. Where do you think the best risk adjusted return is in the real estate industry today, whether it's a geography or an asset class or an investment type equity or debt? Wow. Well, that's a, that's a hard question. Isn't that what everyone wants to know? Um, huh, let me think about that. The way I see it is I want to find the opportunity that makes the most sense on the longest like time horizon because I'm pretty young. And so I, I you know, I'm, I expect to be here for a while. And so when I look at an investment, I kind of, I want to look on the, the longest time frame and see like where the macroeconomic picture makes the most sense um, from that perspective. So um, in that regard, I, the, my favorite determinant to look at, and I think most people would be population growth. So I definitely am looking in, like, I think that Texas and Florida, where a lot of people seem to be moving to for, for various reasons, seems to be um, a place where the, in the long term, um, investments will do well. And, uh, you know, people, you know, there's job growth, there's population growth, there's, um, I guess, it's pretty easy for real estate investors, or I guess, relatively than some other jurisdictions. Um, that being said, I'm worried about insurance costs and, um, you know, threats of disaster in certain coastal markets. So that's one thing that, um, you know, I think insurance has a lot of room to grow in terms of expense. So I, I worry about like, S Southern Florida a little bit too. So I'd say if we're eliminating Florida in that respect, that Texas would be um, pretty attractive jurisdiction for long-term investing. And um, just from a supply demand perspective, I like to look at multifamily because it's like, yeah, maybe people want to shop less. Maybe people want to, you know, don't want to go to the office anymore. Maybe, you know, our supply chain will get so efficient that we don't need as much warehouse space. But, you know, I think people are always going to enjoy roofs. And as long as people like a roof over the head, multifamily seems to be a good mm -hmm. investment in the long run. So that's something that definitely interests me from a macroeconomic perspective, is, which is the scope I was taking. But if we're talking right now, um, where the, I think like maybe the most risk adjusted, risk adjusted return is for in terms of yield, that retail is very underlooked. I don't think that institutions are playing in retail as much as you know they're they're definitely super hungry for in industrial driving down cap rates and they're super um, hungry for multifamily, which is, you know, causing a lot of pricing pressure. But um, retail, I think, is where is a place where you can get a lot of yield and that there are places that there are, there is essential retail where, you know, on the corner of Maine and Maine, I think that that's always going to be a junction where people are interacting and where people are traveling and just being a social, um, being social creatures. I think that there will be an in-person in aspect of the future. And so I'm not I'm, I think I'm a little bit more bullish on retail than most people. So that's my answer. <laughs> Texas, multi and retail, mixed use. How about that? I'll summarize yeah. it for you. There you go. That sounds, that sounds like it. That's the, that's the thesis. Awesome. Well, awesome. So PJ, where could uh, people learn more about what you are doing and, um, you know, just learn more about green solutions in general? Um, well, I do have a website, pjfinley.com, where I have blog i've only posted two articles as far it's it's uh you know it's time consuming that what i do post is heavily research focused and in effect their research papers so um takes a lot of time and i only do it you know on the weekend so it's not taking away from my day job so only have two so far but i'll be continuing um to post and there's some stuff on my angel investments um other than that you know i'm on linkedin and um yeah that's it not a huge uh, social media person. Mm -hmm. All right. That's no problem. Definitely. Uh, it sounds like you, you had a lot to focus on. Well, PJ, I greatly appreciate you coming on the show today to touch on a topic that's very important to me and definitely <laughs> seems very important to you. And I think that is important to a lot of listeners and honestly, for the entire world. So it's been a pleasure to have your expert insights and opinions um, shine through and appreciate your time. 
and uh, everybody, keep making milestones. Before you go, I just wanted to say thanks again for tuning in to another awesome episode of Real Estate Milestones. If you've been enjoying the show and you'd like to offer your support, please leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It's the best way to increase the show's visibility and help the message get out to a greater audience. I really appreciate your time and support, and keep making milestones.